Um, indeed, I, I enjoyed the past few days here. I learned a lot of, of things and met uh, new people. Uh, it was extremely instructive. The place is beautiful. So I think the organizers, um, I hope you can organize it again and, and invite maybe some, some people again. Um, please stop me at any point in time and, and, uh, and ask questions, if you have questions. And I hope I'll, I'll be able to answer them. Um, so I'm, I'm interested also in, in how the brain extracts information about uh, the environment in terms of smell. And um, what we're going to discuss today is, uh, uh, see if this works. I need them. Um, oh, oh, here. Yes. Okay. Good. So. Smells come in um, nature in all kinds, in plumes. They appear and disappear, uh, as um, Andreas has talked to us yesterday. Um, and they carry a lot of information about the identity, the intensity, the time, the position, and the balance of all kinds of objects in the, in the environment. And the brain has evolved um, such a way that it extracts all this kind of information and it, it parses it in such a way that it's, um, it's organized according to to the needs of the moment. And sometimes you might need some information and ignore some other, other kind of information. And that may change as a function of, of context. So I'm, I'm interested in understanding how the brain is, is extracting some, some useful information and ignoring some, some other kind of information as a function of, of context and, and experience. And um, um, we, we think that the brain is using um, a mix of um, fit forward and uh, and feedback signaling. And um, one attempt is to observe the brain in, in action by monitoring and, and manipulating the activity of inputs and outputs and feedback loops as, as animals are engaged in behaviors and hope that if you, if you collect a large number of, of, uh, of such, um, such information, then uh, you'd ex expect to actually form um, some prediction and, and obtain some model, some, some understanding of the of the brain. Um, and, and the question here is really how the brain builds an adaptive model of the environment as the animal is interacting with the environment in open loop or in, in closed loop. And, and how, how, um, how is possible to actually use mice that are engaged in a factual task to study that? Today I'm going to pose two questions, and I hope I guess by the end of the, of the talk I'll answer them. One is, um, if different types of feedback projections from the cortex, from different parts of the cortex into the olfactory bulb are carrying different kinds of, of information, and second, if different types of outputs from the bulb, the mitral and tufty cells, also carry actually different kinds of information. And this is going to be all done first in, uh, in awake and has fixed animals that are, uh, are naive, are, are not behaving. And uh, if there's time in the second half of the talk, I'll uh, introduce um, two different tasks in the lab related to reversal learning and, uh, and close to pole faction. So as we heard of, over the past uh, few days and as we are, are all aware of, um, olfaction starts in the epithelium in the nose as, as ligands are binding the, the receptor molecules. And uh, the receptor neurons form these beautiful balls of, uh, of, uh, of synapses in the olfactory bulb. And, uh, and here, the information is, is transferred on dendrites of uh, the mitral and tufty cells, which differ with respect to each other in terms of um, uh, intrinsic properties and, and connectivity in, in the factory bulb, as well as in terms of projection targets. There is a zoo of local interneurons that, I'm not sure, that is, um, yes. A zoo of local interneurons that is transforming the inputs, so from the receptor neurons onto outputs in the matter and tufty cells, and normalizes and and decorrelates the inputs and makes them into into outputs, and and then the information is carried by the the matter and tufty cells to at least um, maybe ten, maybe maybe more areas in the in the brain, and uh, most of these areas send back very strong and uh, and rich 
feedback that impinges onto all kinds of inhibitory interneurons in the olfactory bulb. So, as I was saying, the olfactory bulb is sending information across the whole brain, and uh, these are the names of, of the most, um, um, say, of the, of the largest areas, the anterior olfactory nucleus, hemperiform cortex, and, and tubercle, and, and, and so on and so forth. And a few decades of research has attached some labels onto these, uh, these um, areas in the sense that perhaps some computations would happen here, and, and this would range from uh, localization of the stimulus, extraction of identity, let's say um, spatial navigation, and so on and so forth. It, it remains unclear if these computations emerge locally in these areas, or information is already sorted out at the level of the of our bulb output as a result of um, interplay between the feedback and the feedforward signals that are sent in between the bulb and its areas. So the first question is, do different type of feedback signals from the cortex carry actually different kinds of, of computations? And um, there's a, a lot known, or some, some, some is known about uh, feedforward uh, signaling in, in olfaction, just like in other areas, in, in, uh, in sensory systems. Um, but much less is known about the roles of top-down uh, feedback. And, um, and just like in, in vision and, and audition, a lot of, of ideas have been proposed about um, what is the role of, of feedback that is ranging from um, the idea of gain control to predictive um, some prediction about the stimulus that is sent in the olfactory bulb and perhaps the um, level of mitral and, and, and tufty cells. The information from the incoming stimulus um, and the prediction are are mixed together, and an error signal is sent back onto the, um, on the cortex, and so on and so forth. But in terms of, of real data, there's, there's actually um, a small number of, of experiments. So what we started to, to do is to, to use information from the, from the wiring of the brain and, uh, and focus on two areas, on the piriform cortex and on the anterior olfactory nucleus, and, and, and used to our advantage the fact that perhaps the projections of the mitral and tufty cells are not completely um, unbiased. That you do have, if anything, a projection bias of the tufty cells to the more anterior um, olfactory um, streams. And, um, and, um, and therefore, we, uh, we think that the, or it has been shown that stuff these cells are projecting onto the anterior of our nucleus and the, and the tubercule, whereas at the same time, the mitral cells send information pretty much across on the whole brain, which um, has, um, as Charlie has reminded us a few days ago, um, as a function of birth and a location on the surface of the olfactory bulb. So at the same time, what is also known from the, from the wiring is that feedback that is coming from the piriform cortex or from the anterior olfactory nucleus is biased as well. So if you are to, to look at the, at the feedback fibers that are coming into the bulb from the uh, anterior olfactory nucleus and the piriform cortex, you'll see that the piriform cortex fibers innervate the deeper layers of the olfactory bulb um, and the uh, input from the AON is more spread out across all layers of the, of the bulb. So what um, we started to, to do a, a few years ago is to, to, to try to label these, these types of, um, of feedback fibers and ask how, how does the, the feedback impact the activity of, of mitral and tapsy cells. And two great um, individuals in the lab, Hongu Che and Gonzalo Otazu, have, have taken this job. And they first asked how specific is, is cortical feedback. And they tried to, to test two different scenarios. In, in, in one scenario, the, the feedback is extremely unspecific and, um, and dense. It functions as, as, a, as a form of gain control. So in other words, as, uh, as activity is, is ramping up in the bulb, you send some feedback into the aperture bulb that is impinging excitatory on the inhibitory interneurons and, and pulls down activity in the, in the bulb to avoid Saturation. And a, a different scenario that is ex extremely different is um, that the, um, the feedback is extremely specific and sparse, and um, signals particular 
predictions about these particular features of the stimuli that are sent back into the far tree bulb, and there information is captured about the, the incoming stimulus. So to begin, what Gonzalo and Hongu have done was to actually label these fibers by injecting a virus in the, in the piriform cortex, and they expressed this case GCAM5 in the, in the piriform cortex. And um, they tried to, um, to then image activity in the olfactory bulb using a, it's called a microscope in a, in a wake and a and half his, um, mouse. So you can see here some nice labeling. And uh, as, um, as you zoom in, you can, you can take a set of planes, of optical planes in different layers of the olfactory bulb and image through the olfactory bulb. So this is um, what we have done. And um, going to show a Z-stack through the surface of our bulb, you'll see a large number of, of buttons um, as you go through the Z-stack from the surface into the, the deep layers. Um, suffice to say that actually in terms of, of numbers of fibers, there are many more fibers are coming into the bulb from the cortex and, and other, other areas than inputs that are coming from the, from the nose, from the epithelium. So what Gonzalo and, and uh, Hongu wanted to do is to image the activity of, of these buttons in, in a way can uh, a naive animal simply by shining a um, light and, and uh, presenting a large number of smells. And what they found is, um, first of all, most of the buttons responded to no, to no stimulus that they have, uh, have sampled. It's, a, it's, a, it's still a small set of, of stimuli um, that was chosen somewhat arbitrarily, but about 65% of the buttons did not respond to any of these stimuli. And those that did respond, respond is so very sparse. So if anything, they respond to maybe one to two different odorants. And that's not simply because um, there is something funky happening with the, with the indicator, because if you, um, if you stick an electrode in the piriform cortex and stimulate the piriform cortex uh, electrically and image the activity of the buttons in the bulb, you actually you can drive them. So the, so the buttons have the ability to respond to odorant. It so happened that within the range of stimuli we have, uh, have presented and the range of intensities, um, the responses are extremely sparse and, and, and all specific. And if you were to, to take a, a comparison, they're about 10 times sparser than the activity of, of the output neurons of the mitral and, 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 and tuft cells. Second, they, um, they simply uh, observed two kinds of responses, which would expect normally an enhancement of activity with respect to baseline and a suppression of activity. And in any, any circuit of neurons, you'd expect that to have a mix of excitation and inhibition. But the striking part came when, uh, um, when it, it, it seems that there are two independent channels of information. Some buttons, although they respond very sparsely to odorants, if they respond at all to any odorants, they respond with the same sign. So if, if a given button, as shown here, each row corresponds to a, a particular um, single button, um, and, um, and um, here is, is of, of, of odorants. So if, if a given button is responding by enhancing its activity with respect to baseline um, to particular stimulus, if it responds at all to any other stimulus, it responds also by enhancing its activity. And that's true not only for the sparse responding buttons, but also across the whole population. And the same is true if you look at the suppressed buttons. If, if, um, if at all they respond to, to, to odorants, if they respond by suppression, they will respond by suppression across all, all odorants. So the, the, the fraction of buttons that respond by enhancement and suppression um, to different odorants is, is very small. We don't really understand why this is happening in terms of, uh, of its substrate, if it arises in the cortex or if it's a, a mix of, of that and uh, um, local modulation in the authority bulb. But we speculate that perhaps these two channels are used indeed as um, ways to make a prediction about the stimulus and the, the kinetics of the enhanced responses and of the suppressed responses is different. The enhanced responses are, are, um, are faster and follow the, the stimulus while the suppressed responses are, are actually quite slow. So we, we speculate that perhaps um, um, the enhanced responses represent the similarity between um, the incoming stimulus or the prediction that is made in the cortex about the incoming stimulus and a previously stored information about a particular stimulus. So you could imagine that in the, in the cortex there is a dictionary of, of elements, of objects, of olfactory objects, and as you, as you receive an incoming stimulus and an order, you compare this incoming stimulus against your, your, your set of, 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 of objects and, and form uh, and, and uh, extract um, how similar this particular stimulus is. The second uh, signal, which is actually a, a suppressed signal, um, may reflect the uncertainty, how certain or uncertain you are about 
this particular stimulus, and to begin with, the uncertainty is high, and then as you sniff the stimulus again and again, the uncertainty is going to be low and will stay low for a while as, as you explore the environment. This is all speculation. We have no real evidence for this. We're starting to do some experiments to, to um, actually test it. But the, the focus of, of, the, of the study at the beginning was to understand what is the impact of the um, piriform cortex and the like, nucleus at the level of, of the mitral and the uh, and and tough cells. And at the beginning, what we did was to do a very coarse manipulation, simply inject a drug in the, in the cortex, simusimol, that will actually silence activity of, of the cortex, and image the activity of the mitral and tough cells, again, in awake and naive animals that are, are sampling these, these odorants. This is an example of uh, um, the experiment. This is a field of view of mitral cells in, in awake um, and hefix animal, and uh, each of these is a cell body of, of, of a mitral cell. Uh, presented sort of about maybe 50 odorants across the order of, of, of magnitude, and each row here corresponds to the response of a particular cell to a particular stimulus at a particular intensity. You can see that as the stimulus is presented here, there's an increase in, in fluorescence. Now, um, as you monitor the activity in this small field of view and, um, um, and, uh, and, and do some manipulation in the cortex, you can, you can assess how many cells are responding to this particular stimulus before you suppress the cortex and after you suppress the cortex by uh, introducing musimol. And if anything, you'd, you'd um, um, realize that after suppressing the, the activity in the cortex, both the number of responsive neurons, as well as if you were to, let's say, pick a few neurons here and show the responses as, as um, all the response vectors across all these odorants, the um, sparseness of the responses is, is decreasing. In other words, they respond to many more odorants, which is, in a way is not surprising because the feedback is excitatory and impinges onto inhibitory interneurons. If you remove the feedback, you have uh, um, less inhibition, and therefore you expect to see some increase in, in, in activity of, of the outputs. However, the picture is very different if you are to look at the activity of the top T cells, that's the, that's the second, uh, second class of output neurons. And that's shown here. These are a few uh, such example cells that are shown for a particular smell before and after of the musimol. And as you can see, both in terms of the numbers of activated cells and uh, how many odorants a given cell is responding to, <coughs> sorry, um, that number is not actually changing much. So somehow, at least in terms of, of, of this course metric of um, response amplitude, um, the mitral cells are affected much more by suppressing activity, by suppressing the, the cortex, than the activity in the, in the tough cells. Yes. Yes. The tubercule does not send back feedback, but the AON does. And the second part of the talk is exactly about that. So you uh, are on the right track. Um, so we, we wondered also in terms of, of uh, representations of odorants at the level of, of, the, of the mitral and, and, and tapsy cells. Let's say a particular odorant would activate a set of, of mitral and tapsy cells in a, in a particular set of, of uh, spatial and temporal um, activation pattern. And uh, if you are to be an observer that is reading information from, from these mitral cells or the cells, you could uh, compare the presentations of different odorants and assess how similar or how different these representations are, the level of either mitral cells or, or tufty cells, simply by, um, on the first pass, by looking at the overlap in the responses across all these cells in the same field of view. So you can compare, in a way, the cell response vectors for different odorants and assess how similar or how different the presentations of different odorants uh, odorants are. And to begin with, the similarity between um, all pairs of odorants that we have, uh, have, have tried, the level of mitral cells is, is quite low, or it's lower compared to the uh, similarity of, of pairs of odorants level of, of, um, of tufty cells. Once you block activity in the piriform cortex, this similarity shifts to the right, which means that in the absence of the cortex, the odorants appear to be more similar to each other from the point of view of, of, um, of mitral cells. In other words, if you are to be an observer and trying to decode information from, from, these, uh, from these mitral cells, it will be harder. Whereas in the case of, of, um, of tufty cells, there's no much difference. So again, um, suggesting that the effect of, of feedback is specific on the, on the mitral cells somewhat and not on, on the tufty cells. A different way to, to put the same observation is if you are to look at how many dimensions, if you are to 
do to explain the activity of, of, of the neurons in terms of, of, of variance of how much um, how many different dimensions you need to actually capture this variance um, as you as you block activity in the cortex the um, the number of dimensions that you, you need to explain activity of myelin cells is lower in other words you need you, the, um, the responses become less complex whereas the, the activity of of tufted cells actually is, is, is unchanged. So I think we, we, we have uncovered the, a way of, of saying that the feedback from the piriform cortex aids specifically the separation of odorants only at the level of, of or, or mostly at the level of mitral cells and not so much level of, of, uh, of tufted cells. And, and clearly, um, we have um, wondered what is happening with, with the activity of, of these guys. Since indeed there is a bias in projection, the, the the mitral cells project um, strongly to um, the facial cortex and, and less so to the anterior facial nucleus, whereas the tufted cells project more to the anterior facial nucleus and less so to the piriform cortex. We wondered if there is a similar um, thing happening from the point of view of, of tufted cells. So we, uh, we asked how does the feedback from the AON impact the activity of, of tufted cells? And we did exactly the same experiment to image activity of, of, of tufted cells. In this case, this is an example of a, a control experiment where you injected saline in the... Yes? Yes, yes. So on, on average... Yes, yes, that's exactly, that's one, um, one idea and they're trying to actually test it. The um, projections from the piriform cortex seem to innervate the deep layers of the bulb more so than projections from the anterior facial nucleus. And indeed they may um, actually synapse on the deep interneurons, on, on the deep granule cells, whereas the projections from the, from AON may synapse across all layers of the, uh, of the cortex. That is our, um, our thinking as well. Yes, and, and a few groups have, have shown that already, in, including this gentleman. Yeah. So, it should, I mean, it, it may not be directly relevant to this discussion. Joel Price also pointed out some years ago that those, those uh, neurons that are We have not yet looked into, into that yet, exactly. We like to be able, ideally, to look in different colors at the feedback fibers and the activity of the ground cells, and, um, and more than that, do manipulations and suppress activity of, of the feedback fibers in a particular sub-region sub, uh, sub of, a, of a cell, but that's um, for the future, perhaps. So we started with extremely coarse manipulations, and, um, and, and, and in this case, looking at the effect of injecting Musimol in the AON on the Tufty cells, and indeed compared to the cell in control, there's an increase in, uh, in, uh, in activity as uh, you suppress activity of the AON at the level of, of, uh, of Tufty cells. So um, similarly to what we've seen in the case of mitosis for the piriform cortex, if you suppress the, the, the AON, the, the firing of, of tufted cells is, is, uh, is increased. And, uh, and this effect is, uh, is much stronger. So here, what is plotted is the distance from the regression line with respect to saline um, for tufted cells. So each dot here is one cell order pair across the set of orders that we have used. And uh, this is shown from the point of view of, of tufted cells as you block activity of AON or of or piriform cortex, and you can clearly see that the central effect is much higher for the um, suppression of, of AON. And complementary, if you are to look from the point of view of either tufted or mitral cells, if you suppress activity in the AON, the, the effect seems to be um, uh, much stronger on the tufted cells compared to the mitral cells. There is actually a small effect on the mitral cells as well, but um, the, there is a strong preference towards boosting activity of tufted cells as you suppress activity of of AON. So it looks like there are two different, two different channels. And in terms of representations at the level of, of, of neurons, um, of, of, of odorants, 
Um, again, you can compare different odorants in terms of the overlap of, in their responses of, of, um, of mitre and, and, and tufted cells. And um, as you'd expect, as you block activity in the AON, the similarity of odorants from the point of view of, of tufted cells is increasing. In other words, if you were to be an observer and try to extract information from the tufted cells about the similarity of odorants, it would be harder in the absence of input from the AON. And, and this effect is, is much stronger for the tufted cells compared to mitral cells if you suppress activity in the, in the AON. So, it, it looks like perhaps there are two different streams of information, both feed forward as well as feedback, that will have some, some matching of the, the biases in targeting of feed forward projections as well as in specificity of, of feedback, in such that uh, uh, mitral cells project most or strongly to the, um, the piriform cortex and in turn the piriform cortex through a set of interneurons that we are still trying to, to study um, is suppressing activity of mitral cells and the similar um, activity of, of tufted cells is reflected in AON and, and then back suppressing the activity of, of, uh, of tufted cells. So if, if this is true, then you, you do need a, a substrate and we're trying to understand if this is actually happening at the level of, of, um, of the ground cells indeed. And, uh, and, uh, and the idea is that uh, both AON and piriform cortex project uh, and synapse onto, onto ground cells. Maybe the, the piriform cortex in the deep layers of the bulb and the AON across a few different layers. And in turn, the, the um, interneurons inhibit the activity of, of tufted and mitral cells. So we started to actually image the activity of, of, of the ground cells in, in awake and, uh, and naive animals, ask how, how their activity is impinged upon if you suppress activity in the piriform cortex or in the AON, and see if, if this idea is actually true or, or, or not. So perhaps there are actually different uh, subsets. And uh, these cells are known to be um, many. So actually, if you look at, at the bulb, about maybe 90% of all cells in, in the bulb are, uh, are ground cells. And uh, they're also known to be very silent if you record in an uh, anesthetized animal. This is not true in a, in a way, even uh, it's fixed a naive animal. There's a lot of spontaneous activity. And uh, upon blocking um, activity of, of, the, of the cortex, of the piriform cortex, we noticed that um, we see both um, a decrease in drive, in spontaneous drive, as you'd expect, but also in, in some cases, you actually see enhancement of activity, that as you remove activity of, of the piriform cortex, actually in a, in a subset of cases, you actually boost the spontaneous activity of, of ground cells. And that's a bit surprising because um, the expectation is that the feedback is excitatory and impinges on, the, on this, uh, these ground cells, but I'll, I'll maybe tell you why, why we think that is the so case. This is, this, the ground cells are labeled using um, CST cream. CST labels all kinds of neurons in the Hochschild bulb across all layers pretty much. We simply image deep in the, in the bulb. Um, but the same, same kind of data you can get if you simply inject deep in the bulb uh, um, a virus and image, you will see very similar activity. Yes. Yes, and, and, and also on top of that, you can um, find ways to label in a different color the deep short actin cells, for example, and compare the activity of deep short actin cells and the uh, ground cells. Yes, question. Yes, that is the problem. That although we claim we are good at imaging, we um, are able to only image the superficial uh, layers. So. Superficial means as deep as about 500 microns, but this is still somewhat superficial because if you're to, to go to the structure of the bulb, there are going to be layers of ground cells, layers after layers after layers, until pretty much eight, 900 microns deep. And uh, the dendrites of these, uh, of these deep cells probably are contacting the, the um, lateral dendrites of, of, of mitral cells, whereas the, the most superficial ones may contact the, uh, the dendrites of, of, um, of tufted cells and mitral cells. So, we are limited to some degree by how, how deep we can image. And we are trying to actually go around it as I'll talk about in a second. Also, um, um, if you are to look at other induced responses for a particular cells, cell A and cell uh, um, as you remove activity in the cortex, the, the response is, is, uh, is abolished. But in some cases, actually, you boost the activity of, of the cell. And interestingly, this effect appears to be cell specific and not other specific. In other words, if at all a given cell is responding to any of these arbitrary odorants that you are, are presenting, 
If you see an effect, because in about half of the cases you, you don't see any kind of, of, of effect of, of blocking activity in either the cortex or AON, if you see an effect, it seems to be a specific uh, sign. So the polarity of the effect is either enhancement for all um, cell order pairs at this particular cell response. So if for all orders at this particular cell response too, all these are enhanced, whereas, uh, and, 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 and similarly it happens for this cell and this cell and this cell, whereas the responses of, of these cells are all suppressed. And, and perhaps uh, we, we still don't understand actually how this is happening, but it suggests that you have very specific connectivity of the feedback fibers at the level of particular cells, and perhaps these two channels of enhanced and suppressed uh, um, buttons may, may be biased in, in a way. Yes, question. So in our hands, I mean, it could be simply our hands. Um, in our hands, about half of the cells we do not see any any effect of, of, the, of the drug, uh, and, and the rest half um, about um, about a quarter were enhanced, and about three quarters were uh, suppressed. Yeah. So as you'd expect, the, the more more um, um, frequent event is suppression. You remove the excitatory drive, but in about a quarter of the cases, you actually see boosting activity. And, and perhaps one, one explanation for, for this, which is again a bit uh, hand wavy at this point, is that feedback doesn't go only onto those uh, on the ground cells, but also on many other interneurons, and maybe even also on, on, uh, on the output neurons. And uh, one, one class of such interneurons has been described um, as uh, deep short axon cells, although they actually have very long um, axons. And uh, these particular cells get strong feedback from the cortex, and in turn, they actually inhibit the activity of, of, um, of ground cells. You could imagine ways in which, by removing the excitatory drive, you could actually induce both uh, uh, lack of activity as well as some disinhibition of, of activity of, of, of ground cells. So I told you that, that uh, we started to actually look for, um, are there any classes, any two distinct classes of ground cells that are, are specifically affected by manipulations of AON or the PD from cortex? And um, uh, currently, we don't have an answer yet, simply because we are not able to image as deep as we would like to do so. And uh, what we try to do currently is to um, do some damage to the bulb, <laughs> implant a small small prism in the in the bulb, and let uh, the bulb recover. Actually, it's not the prism; it's a small mirror, in a way, that looks like a prism. So you shine light from the side and can image across all layers of the bulb after a few weeks after the animal has recovered with a big caveat that you make a hole in the circuit. Alternatively, we are trying to use some different uh, forms of microscopy, three photo microscopy, and image deeper and deeper in the in the bulb. But that that will take some time. So it, it, it looks like if the ground cells are, are the um, substrate of, of this feed feed forward feedback interplay, uh, we still don't know if indeed there are, we have not found to, that that is true that there are two classes of, of, of ground cells. But in the in the process, we discovered that perhaps um, the suppression is of, of feedback has bidirectional effects of the level of, of, of ground cells. And the feedback seems to be very specific but in terms of cells and not necessarily of, of odorants, at the level of, of the effect on the cells. So I told you in the beginning that, we, yes, question. I'm not very sure at all. Yes. 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 So there is um, the, the dirty secret of any kind of, uh, of Muslim experiment is that you don't know for sure how how much the spread is. What you do is in each experiment we inject in three different locations at three different sites in each location, and then after the experiment we uh, quantify uh, roughly how how big the spread is by using uh, the same. So you inject Muslim oil that is fluorescent, and you can see how much is spread although it can spread quite fast. Um, and, uh, but the, um, the answer to your question is that you don't know for sure. And uh, therefore, this is just one first uh, attempt. And what we currently are doing is to replace Mosimol, which actually, in the first place, is a bad tool to, to use because you block activity of the cortex, and, and that's not what you want to do, with um, tools that allow you to shine light in the bulb. So you express a virus in the, in the cortex, and then instead of suppressing activity in the cortex itself, you try to shunt activity of, of the fibers. And I'll, I'll talk about it in a, in a few minutes. But it's, it's a good point. It's, yeah. Any other question about this? Yes. Yes. 
I don't. Um, you think there are different cells because the responses are so strikingly different? Suppressed, yeah. Yes. I mean, if you, if you believe if you believe that indeed the activity that we see in the axon is a the terminal is a proxy for the firing of the, of the neuron, that is true. It could also be that there is some complicated and not understood mechanism of local modulation in the bar, but I, I don't really believe. But it's true that actually, if you recall in the cortex, people have, have reported that they can find cells that are mostly enhanced and mostly suppressed. So it, it could be that indeed there are cells in, in the cortex. Now, if this is a genetically identified type of cell, or this cell arises simply by wiring, by what kind of inputs it gets. I mean, it's, it's, it's a matter of, of um, debate what you define to be a cell type. So <laughs> I, I have no idea, but I, I hope that one day this gentleman here may, um, may find some, some, uh, some markers that would allow us to actually label them. Um, yeah, so it's still unclear. Yes. yes. Yes, yes, they are, they are, yeah. No spatial arrangement. We, we, we lost hope of any kind of spatial arrangement. And not even order dependent spatial arrangement. Yes, so in, in the same um, small neighborhood, you can have all kinds of, of uh, effects. Okay, so I started from the feedback side, but, but clearly um, there are two streams of feed forward information, the mitral and tafty cells, and uh, um, Orko and Hongu and, and Fred and Lab have, have wondered to begin with, if um, um, they carry different kinds of information in the beginning from the point of view of extracting information about the concentration of the stimulus and identity of the stimulus or extracting identity information independent of, of, of concentration. And uh, if you're just to image the, the activity of, of mitral and tufty cells, again, in awake and, and naive animals, you would, you would immediately realize the responses of, of, of these cells, and, and by no means we are the first ones to, to show this, has been shown over and over again, they are actually are quite different, that the, the responses of, uh, um, of mitral cells are uh, quite sparse and not so monotonic as you increase the intensity of the stimulus, whereas the responses of, of tufty cells are, are quite dense, so they respond uh, a lot, and as you increase the intensity of the stimulus, you get stronger and stronger responses. Now, um, if you are to, to, to average the response of, of a, a particular cell for a particular concentration and then plot uh, the response curve across um, different concentrations for this particular cell, for both tough and mitral cells, it becomes quite obvious that you can't really rely on single cells to tell, um, to extract information about identity and, and, and stimulus intensity because as you change the intensity and, and the identity of the stimulus, um, um, the, the um, response of the cell is changing in quite unpredictable fashion. So, um, so therefore, individual cells are poor encoders of both identity and, and intensity. And um, then the next best regime, or the next simplest regime, will be uh, a linear regime, indeed, if you look at a, uh, a set of, of neurons, and, uh, and ask yourself if um, the behavior of mitral and tufty cells is amenable to linear decoding um, or, or not. And I would argue that if, if you plot, let's say, the representations um, in this schematics of two orderings in terms of the firing rate of n, n neurons in this space, if uh, across concentrations um, you behave monotonically, or these neurons actually are responding in a monotonic fashion, then you stand as a, a better chance to separate the identity of these two orderings if the responses are, are monotonic versus uh, if, if not. So our prediction was that Tufty cells ensembles would, should, would be superior to mitral cells at linear decoding of identity of, of the stimulus in a concentration invariant manner. It's unclear if the brain does linear decoding in, in any way, but this is just an, an exercise to begin with. So we, we try to, to, to train a, a classifier and, uh, and formally, let's say, um, for a set of five order runs across uh, four different uh, concentrations, let's say, train um, five hypothetical um, classifier neurons to extract information from the experimental data from the mitral and tufty cells with different weights. And um, train them using sparse, linear, um, sparse, sparse logistic regression and impose some, some constraints in such a way that uh, these weights are sparse. So you have a small number of non-zero weights and you minimize the difference between the predictions of the, of the network and, uh, and reality, such as to, to, to match the, the representation, the sparseness representations that you observe experimentally. 
And for example, the, the job of, of uh, order one neuron would be to respond to any concentration of stimulus one, but uh, only to stimulus one. The job of uh, um, um, order two neuron is, is, would be to respond to any instantiation of stimulus two, and so on and so forth. So if, if, if you do that and, and, and you train the, the, the classifier and impose the constraints and challenge the classifier with uh, our set of, of data and, and, and do some validation, then you you'd actually see that indeed the performance of the classifier is much higher for the activity of Tufti cells compared to the activity of, of, uh, of mitral cells. So if, if the brain would be to do linear um, decoding of identity in terms of uh, in invariance of, of, of concentration, the, the Tufti cells would actually be superior. And that's perhaps um, becoming more interesting as you go back and think about the projection patterns of of Tufti cells. If it's true that Tufti cells project mostly to the anterior partial nucleus and, and the tubercule, then perhaps these areas also have access to, or are also in a position to, to compute information about the identity of the stimulus. And it's not only the piriform cortex that uh, has been highlighted over the past few decades that is, uh, is, is extracting this information. I mean, all, obviously the information from the AON is going to the, the cortex. And, uh, and vice versa, so there's a lot of, of, um, of crosstalk, but um, this suggests that, that there is information that leaves the bulb that does not need necessarily to pass through the Fauci cortex, you can go to the, the AON and the tubercule, and these areas may be in a position to compute the identity of the, of the stimulus. And by currently doing experiments and recording from AON and tubercule and the, and the piriform cortex and see if this is actually true. More than that, what we have shown you so far was pretty much um, an exercise of futility because all these animals are awake and head fixed. They are not doing anything. They're just uh, experiencing this disodorance. We like to understand if these, uh, these loops of um, feed forward and, and feedback signaling are engaged in the way that we predict through these uh, humble experiments uh, as mice are, are actually engaged in concentration um, reporting and identification uh, of, of of odorants. So the same animal is going to be trained in reporting either a change in concentration or in a different session of um, a change in identity of the stimulus. And what we like to do is to suppress activity of the feedback from the piriform cortex or feedback from the AON and the image activity of mitral and tufty cells and test if these manipulations have differential effect in terms of reporting one feature or the other, or perhaps um, these two features of concentration and identity are actually not what, what uh, these particular areas are important for, but um, something different. OK, since we got very interested in uh, specificity of projections, um, we got a bit obsessed about um, the idea whether um, virtual bar projections to different areas are organized by the information content. Or you can rephrase the question, do select sets of mitral and tufty cells carry similar information um, if they do carry some information, do they project to similar uh, areas? And um, perhaps to begin to answer this, this question, we first pose the question about the anatomical projections from the mitral and tufty cells to the rest of the brain. Are there any biases at the level of single cells, single mitral cells, uh, or single sets? Of, or at the level of single cells, can you see any biases in terms of what areas the particular cell is projecting to? And uh, clearly, this, this question has been posed over the past few decades, and um, the classic approach is to inject the dye very sparsely and, and, and label one or two neurons and reconstruct the whole, um, whole axon um, of the neuron across the whole brain and see if you need uh, any, any biases. And uh, we are extremely lucky that we are taking advantage of, uh, of new developments spearheaded by um, our neighbors in Cosmic Harbor by the Zeder lab. Um, so we, we are using DNA barcoding of neurons and sequencing to answer this question. And, 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 um, and the way we are doing it is, is, is the following. So these people, the people actually are, are doing the work is Justus and Shaoyin in, in Tony's lab and Yushu and, and uh, Pedro in, in, in my lab. And, and the idea is, is, I would say, elegant and simple and robust. It's, um, it's Tony's idea. And he, uh, um, my mind, had a... Um, quite a brilliant idea, because it's very simple. All what this method entails is to express a large diversity of barcodes virally, and um, do it so in such a way that a given barcode is going to infect one cell at a time, 
And then um, if you are interested in the statistics of projections of neurons from one area to n other areas across the brain, all we have to do is to extract the barcodes from the injected area and the areas of, of interest and sequence them and determine what barcodes are present in area 1 and 2 or 1 and 2 and 3 or 2 and 3 and, and so on and so forth. So in one experiment, you can actually, uh, because you can express a large diversity of, of barcodes, a few hundred million by now, you can be quite sure that you can uniquely label on the order of a few thousand cells per brain. So as you go from having one or two or three cells labeled per brain and basically actually slicing the brain and constructing it, now in, in one go, if you are not really interested at the, um, at the high spatial um, resolution, simply understanding what are the chances of cells from the Fauci bile to project to the tubercule and the AON, but not to the amygdala or to the amygdala and, uh, and the piriform and so on and so on and so forth then you send a chance to actually do that. Now, we, we, um, um, we done a proof of experiment with, um, with this uh, idea by labeling a small nucleus, LC, that contains about 2,000 neurons. In the field, there was a debate whether the, these neurons, uh, which are um, um, projecting across the whole neocortex and uh, of our chip bulb, are they ramifying, so a given neuron, does it send branches across the whole neocortex and the bulb, uh, or particular sets of neurons project to particular areas? And the, I'll say the classical model, although there's been a, a debate for a long time, was that the, the neurons will project indiscriminately across all areas. Um, using this, this idea, this um, MAPSIC idea, uh, in injecting the, the um, LC, you can actually see a very different picture. Um, so here what is plotted is the identity of the neuron, which is the identity of a particular barcode, against um, different slices that are taken on the anterior-posterior axis of the brain. And uh, the, the color or the intensity reflects the relative frequency of a particular barcode in a particular area across all these um, slices. So you can see that a large number of neurons have very specific um, um, projections to the Fauci bulb and then across the whole, whole neocortex. So it, 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 it appears that perhaps these neurons actually have um, a bias in their projections. It, it, it doesn't mean that they are doing actually different things, but at least anatomically, they are projecting in a differential fashion. So we wonder if uh, uh, by any chance um, a similar or um, um, a biased view will emerge for the activity or for the projection patterns of mitral and, and, and tufty cells. And we have been um, trying to inject the, the virus in the Fauci bulb and slice the rest of, of the brain and, and extract in, um, tissue to begin with from six different areas and determine the statistics of projections. This can just be that the infected wall cells are different. Yes. So on the first pass, we don't know. We don't know if there are amandices or, or tufty cells. What we are doing currently is to actually slice the Fauci bulb itself and uh, pick uh, cells from the dorsal surface, the ventral surface, so the dorsal lateral aspect and, and, the, and the middle ventral aspect, and also separate between the mitral cells and, and tufty cells. But in the first pass, uh, no. And, uh, and uh, uh, yes. Yes. No, the conclusions are actually um, consistent with each other. There's just a difference in method. So the the, um, the um, Lichen Luo lab um, has not had the ability to have single cell resolution. So if you are to actually look at, at, at bundles of cells, you can, um, um, or if you are to pull together cells, you will see that indeed um, you get projections across the whole. Resolution. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. But in any case, I agree with you that you need a separate metric to actually um, to test this, these ideas because um, you are limited by how much RNA you can extract and how much volume you can extract and so on and so forth. So what I'm trying to do is to compare this with uh, what you'd get if you do imaging as well. Now, uh, if you take this approach to the Fauci bulb, and um, this is, again, very preliminary data. We only have two brains analyzed, and these are the first two brains that you should, the person who has been doing it has actually has ever touched. So perhaps you uh, should keep that in mind. It looks like perhaps we do have some biases, that uh, um, these are um, the, the barcodes extracted from AON, the piriform cortex anterior and posterior, the tubercule, amygdala, and uh, interline cortex, and so on and so forth. So perhaps uh, you do have some biases in some cells projecting mostly to, to the AON, but not to the 
the PD4 cortex, which would actually be um, consistent with the idea of having mitral and antarctic cells separated. But more than that, some new biases will actually emerge that perhaps some, some cells are biased towards the tubercule and not so much to AON, and some to the AON, and so on and so forth. So this is all very preliminary, I, I would um, caution you. Now we are trying to do this properly and really slice the brain at fine resolution and from each slice extract um, all these areas of interest and in a way for each barcode create um, an, um, a vector of, of projections. And then what we like to do, and which would be probably a very tedious process, is to compare the functional responses of the mitral and tufty cells in vivo that you obtain by imaging with, with uh, odorants. And ideally, not with arbitrary odorants, but odorants actually mean something to the animal in a mouse that is actually engaged in a particular task. And then um, use the beauty of um, in situ sequencing. So there is a very fashionable technique, uh, fluorescence in situ sequencing, that is extremely inefficient, but still um, it, it, it gives you the ability to, to sequence in situ, which means that you can identify the same search you image in vivo, and you have played your odorants uh, across uh, um, um, in, in the intact brain, in, 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 the, in the slice, and then sequence the barcode from these particular cells, and then determines through MAPSIC the projection patterns of, of these cells. So you would actually go from the functional tuning of the cell to the location of the cell in the fortune bulb and the projection patterns across the whole brain. It could be, again, that you will not learn much from it. There's no guarantee. But it could also be that um, in an extreme other scenario, that actually perhaps you will learn something about some um, encoding of particular stimulus features as you, you compare the tuning of the cells to, um, uh, to odorants and the pollution patterns across the, the brain. So initially, I posed um, two questions. One uh, was, do different fit for the, let's say, mitral and tufty cells projections carry different kind of information? And second, do different feedback projections implement different kinds of computations? And I would say I, I showed you some evidence that perhaps the ensembles of, of tufty cells are superior to mitral cells in terms of linear decoding of identity of odorants independent of concentration. And the feedback tends to be specific. The feedback from the piriform cortex mostly affects activity of mitral cells, and that from AON mostly affects the activity of, of tufty cells, although we don't really yet know so what mechanism. And now I'm not sure how much time I have. Five minutes. Do you have any questions about the things I, I, I talked about so far? Yes, Tim. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yes. It to be more um we are, are trying to actually look into that and um I hope I have an answer soon, but not yet. Yes, question. Yes, that is true. So in this case what I've shown you is acquired at, um, so in the beginning we started with, uh, with GCAM3, which was extremely slow, and also with slow uh, scanning microscopes, which was acquired about 5 hertz. These days we are imaging at uh, 50 to 100 hertz, so GCAM6F is still, it's calcium imaging, so it's slow, but still you, you have the ability now to actually bin and by recording respiration as well, so you are able to look at uh, single sniffs and um, separate the activity of, of, of um, the first sniff and second sniff and so on and so forth. And indeed, you can see that the response of tufty cells um, predate the activity of, of mitral cells. Uh, but I think it's, it's more than that because you, you can actually increase the integration um, bin and uh, include both activity of tufty cells and, and the mitral cells. And on top of the fact that they respond early, you can actually separate them more easily in, in the space of It's a speculation. Uh, it's a speculation. It's, uh, we have no recordings to show that. It's just that uh, the projections are going there. No, no. So, uh, yes. 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 
Yes. So I'm, I'm not saying in any way that the responses to concentration are, um, are flat. As you increase the concentration, in this case, for the Tufti cells, the responses are monotonically increasing. But the fact that they follow a simple function like this, they simply are going up as you increase the concentration, makes it easier if you are to um, be um, an observer to uh, apply a boundary and separate the presentation of order A and order B. As long as you learn that order A is encoded by some, uh, some um, set of, of, um, of neurons, so it's easier to separate order A and order B in a linear way because the response of the neurons are actually quite simple to, to describe by a simple function. Yes, but you're adding additional neurons. To yes, you do, you do, you do. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. You have to do that on size. So you have to, yeah, you have to take these stacks. You have to slice the brain. You have to then find the same cells from in vivo to in vitro. It sounds very, very awful, and indeed it, it is awful. But it, it, it has been done by a few groups already by, by Tom, Tom Mershich, uh, and, um, and and algorithms help. Actually, it, it turns out that it, it's um, it's not so um, so hard these days. Uh, but it, it is indeed tedious, and you'll have a small number of cells to begin with, and then there'll be a few iterations until you actually get better. And, and even on top of that, the efficiency of FISIC or FISIC, uh, different uh, versions, at this point is quite low. So you will, um, you, this is not going to be, to begin with, a high throughput method, but because it's sequencing and because it's a large market, my feeling is that, or my, my prediction is that, because of that, in a few years, this will become uh, standard. So now it's crappy. It's very crappy. It's low efficiency and it's, it's tedious. But I, I would say that it's um, it, it has some hope for it at least. Okay. M maybe if you allow me for two minutes, I want to tell you something about um, the behaving brain, not only some some animal that is, is is there. No. One minute. Okay. Then I will skip. I will skip all this. All this, and I will. Um, Okay, I will, I will just um, give a teaser about something that actually I'm extremely excited um, about at this point. It's, it's very early on, but to my mind, it has the power of, um, of um, answering some interesting questions. And that is um, having an animal that is head fixed, which allows you to, um, to do manipulations and imaging and so on and so forth. Um, and at the same time, having the animal in charge of the stimulus. So there's clearly a huge difference between having an animal that is passively exploring, is, is getting all kinds of, of inputs from the environment, either in the case of, of vision, if you are static and let's say some visual stimulus is coming at you versus if you are actually immersed in the, in the, immersed in the environment. And similarly, I would expect that if the animal is simply standing there, sitting there for many, many hours and, and smelling all kinds of things and, and trying to actually make sense of, of the world, the probably is very different from an animal that is, is, is moving. But perhaps you can still have an animal that is head fixed, which has some advantages, but give the animal the choice to control the stimulus. And, uh, and, uh, and Priyanka and, and Marie in the lab have done exactly this. Um, in this task, the animal is head fixed and um, is learning to operate a joystick, a lever. And by doing so, is engaging a stepper motor, and the stepper motor has a belt attached to it. And on the belt, we mounted a manifold that can deliver odorants. Um, the manifold has a central tube that you can, um, a port that you are going to push the order through, and uh, a few ports on the left and right side that you use to to give order to to give air, such that the flow is is not a, um, an issue. So what you want to to train the animal to do is to 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 use the feedback from the order itself and localize the odorant without actually moving. So by moving this lever. Uh, they are going to, to um, start um, mapping the position of the, of the smell on, on this axis. So they move the lever like this, and the, and the smell is moving on, on this axis. They could also move the lever like this in principle, and the, the smell can go on, on this axis. Uh, but to begin with, uh, we're moving like this, and the smell is going on, on this side. And the task of the animal is to bring the odor in front of, of the snout and keep it there for a while. So the animal is, is head fixed, is initiating the trial by pulling this lever and holding it there for a bit. And then uh, the task is to center the, the odorant. And, um, and then if it, if it centers it, it keeps it there for a few hundred milliseconds. If it does this, it gets a reward. The animal is thirsty, so it's going to work for water. And then it can, it can keep it there for a while. It can 
release it, and then the, a new start, a new trial starts as the animal is um, is pulling the lever again. So um, we, we train these mice in such a way that they cannot rely on a single motion. That you don't simply rely on one trajectory, but you can you actually have a large number of of, um, of target zones. So you are not simply learning a motor uh, trajectory. And um, we don't use a single odorant, but a few such odorants. So they simply have to rely on the feedback from the stimulus, independent of the stimulus A or B or, or C, and localize where the stimulus is. All these experiments are done in the, in the dark. Um, OK, so this is an example of, of such an animal that is, is behaving. And uh, what's plotted here, oops, what's plotted here is, um, um, is the animal that is, is behaving. These are its legs. Each bar, vertical bar, correspond to the, 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 the position of, uh, of, of um, in the trial where the animal has got its first reward. This black trace corresponds to the location of the lever itself, and these um, are, the, are the target zones. In the so the animal is, uh, is head fixed and it's moving this lever, and the, the job of the animal is to take this, this little mark and put it here in this, in this zone. And the animals actually learn to, to do that, and once they realize they can control the stimulus, they can have some, acts, some, some agent on the environment, then they, um, at least our, our minds, they seem to be much more engaged in the task. And they can learn this task. Um, actually, it took us a while to learn ourselves how to, how to train them, but nowadays they can learn within uh, two to three weeks to go up, up on the order of about 80 to 85 uh, percent um, correct trials. And um, what we try to, to use this for now is to actually understand how localization of the stimulus is, is happening. And more than that, in the longer term, to look at sensory motor transformations and understand the logic of motor feedback signals into sensory areas. And even more than that, to understand um, um, target and, and background extraction, because you can uh, add a second such manifold that is moving depending on the first one. And in different trials, you can have a target in the background. The animal is in control of one or the other. So you can extract information about a particular stimulus um, independent of it being in control or not. I will stop here. And uh, I'd like to thank all the people that have been uh, actually involved. Um, Hongu and, and Gonzalo have spearheaded the feedback project. Um, Orko and uh, Fred and um, um, Hongu, uh, might and task itself, and Priyanka and Marie, the, the um, lever task. And these are our uh, sources of funding and friends and collaborators. Thank you.